As a people and as a nation, we've experienced times of great crisis throughout our history. During our war for independence, Washington's army was certainly no match for the superior forces they faced. But in times of both national and personal crisis, the words of a hymn written by Isaac Watts in 1707 declared our complete dependence on Almighty God as our only hope and security. Paraphrasing the first five verses of Psalm 90, Watts expressed this confidence. Spaker, a Chicago attorney, had already suffered great loss in his life when in 1874 his wife and four daughters boarded a ship for England. Just off the coast of Ireland, the ship sank, and Spaker received a cable from his wife. It read, Saved Alone. As he traveled to England, he penned the words, Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. About that time as a nation, we had come through the deep divisions of the Civil War, how people needed to be reminded that God was still sovereign and in control of our lives and our destiny. when he wrote a song to commemorate the 100th birthday of the Declaration of Independence. Later, the song became the official hymn to celebrate the centennial of the U.S. Constitution. Already our country had survived attacks from outside its borders and bitter fighting within them. We had gone west all the way to the Pacific, carrying our hopes, our dreams, and our faith with us. Taking his inspiration from Psalm 44, 1 through 4, Roberts wrote,
thought we were safe within our borders. Isolated by two oceans from much of the world, Americans pursued their personal ambitions and destinies. But in the 20th century, the price of freedom rose dramatically. World War I required America to send her best to the trenches of Europe to fight and die. And World War II required an entire generation to sacrifice their all for freedom. How we needed to be reminded once again that the God of our fathers, who had always been our source of strength, was just as faithful as ever. Nothing you would call miraculous had taken place in Thomas Chisholm's life, but at the age of 75, he had learned that God was unwavering in his love and mercy. I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God, he wrote, and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care, for which I am filled with astonishing gratefulness. These deeply held beliefs were reflected in his most famous hymn. deserved it or earned it, but because God's unmerited favor has been poured out on us individually and as a nation. Because of God's grace, this is a land of tremendous opportunity, endless variety, and great natural beauty. Catherine Lee Bates felt it when in 1893 she looked out from the summit of Pikes Peak. When I saw the view, I felt great joy, she said. As I was looking out over the sea-like expanse of fertile country spreading away so far under those ample skies, the opening lines of a hymn floated into my mind. Her song is still the most widely sung and perhaps most beloved hymn of patriotism ever written.
just a second. So excited. Thank you, choir, for the ministry. I was, I was standing and I guess a little bit awestruck, and so thank you for being patient with me. Uh, thank you for being here. We're excited about all our special guests and visitors, and while we have so much to be thankful for, what a great country we live in. Uh, we continue to be convinced that uh, we live in the greatest nation of the world, and yet we are uh, quick to recognize that we have grave national sins, and it's certainly appropriate today that we would both recognize and repent of those sins. But again, God has been very gracious to us in our choir, and the narration has uh, helped us to understand even why we're certainly undeserving. I will tell you this, though, that uh, one of the links to God's blessing has been that God has indeed been the Father um, and has been the God of our fathers. And uh, so uh, we are greatly privileged uh, because of God's grace and mercy in our lives. We're encouraging you to take a look at your bulletin in regard to a couple of, all the announcements are very important, but a couple of them are especially important. Our VBS, please read the announcement in our bulletin concerning VBS. God graced us this past week. Uh, so many people put so much time and energy into the ministry. A goodly number of our children prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and that's the greatest thing in the whole wide world. And then for you baptismal candidates, uh, also a very important announcement in our bulletin, and for the sake of time, I just will encourage you to read that as well. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 8. We're going to begin reading in verse 15. We'll read through the 22nd verse. So Genesis chapter 8, beginning with verse 15. As you find it, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And God spoke unto Noah, saying, Go forth from the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Even though the imagination of man's heart is evil from his, work, uh, from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold, and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Thank you. You may be seated for a time of prayer. Oh God, we've entered into these gates once again with thanksgiving in our hearts and on this very special day and this very special weekend we have entered with extra praise and thanksgiving. We certainly thank you, Lord, for this country that we live in. We know that part of the reason why you have graced us is because our founding fathers recognized not only that you existed, but that you were seeking to be engaged in our lives. And oh, how our hearts are thrilled as we look back historically and see how uh, these men and women uh, were uh, committed and devoted not only to you, but to your word, the B-I-B-L-E. What a privilege it is for us today to be able to study your word, be our guide as we do. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you bless us not only individually, but corporately as a church. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to give back to you a portion of all that you've entrusted to our care. Thank you, God, for the way that you've been blessing us through the course of this past week with very special activities, and thank you for those who have responded to the blessed gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And know oh, how we pray for those who are here today or within the sound of this voice who have not yet seen their need of Christ because of their sin and turned from such sin and embraced the one and only Savior. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. 
and that they would join us in this great adventure of walking by faith with the Lord Jesus Christ and again allowing the inscripturated word of God to govern our lives. We've come to worship you today, God. To God be the glory we pray in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Amen. Very beautiful. Let's turn to number 692, and we're going to sing one verse, and so as we stand, junior church is going to be dismissed. So let's stand together, sing 692. We're singing the first verse, 692.
Thank you again. Uh, Brother Norm was informing me that uh, a very special part of our missions family is uh, here this morning as well, the Smiths, uh, Terry and Pam, and we welcome them. We welcome you all. And uh, again, what a great day. And let's pray and ask God to quiet our hearts, to quiet Pastor Tom's heart, settle him down, and uh, uh, prep, prep us uh, to, to, to listen and to, and to heed God and his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the word of God, the inscripturated, infallible, inerrant word of God to man. Every day it proves itself. There is no other book like it. And, oh God, because of that and many other reasons, we have every reason to hang on every one of your words. And, and Lord, we love the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and, of course, we're quick to recognize, and this is a, with a view to the teachings of the Bible, that the, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ begins with the bad news of our sin. Here's sinful men. And they're facing an insurmountable problem. Created by God, yes, and created for God, indeed. And yet, we have, like sheep gone astray, we have turned to our own way. We have forsaken you, God. But you are the seeking and saving God, and so you were quick, as it were, to do what needed to be done in order for us to be saved, rescued, redeemed. And so Christ came, the perfect Lamb of God, the God-man. And he mounted Calvary and suffered and died on the cross <clears throat> in our place, bearing the penalty of our sin so that we wouldn't have to. And he, and he alone through his death, burial, and resurrection is offered to every man, woman, and young person the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. Oh, thank you, Lord. And oh God, I pray that you certainly would continue to impress upon every heart the blessed gospel the good news of Jesus Christ. But when we put our faith and trust in him, the B-I-B-O-L-E becomes the perfect guidebook for life. And so we are able to testify that there's not a single aspect of our lives, not any arena of our lives that isn't addressed by your word. And for that, we're thankful. And we've said all that to simply and humbly offer this prayer that once again you would impress upon our hearts your truth, and that as we allow you to do that, that we'd be a changed people. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We celebrate on this July 4th weekend our nation's birthday. Uh, the fact of the matter is we exist as a nation and we are free only because many people have given sacrificially of their time, their talent, and their treasure, and even of their lives. We are, in our study of Genesis, hovering over an amazing biblical example of sacrificial giving, and so appropriately on this July 4th weekend, we stick with our study. I remind you that the flood is over, the earth is dry, and Noah and his family and the representative animals have disembarked the ark. Our verse, Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20, informs us that the very first thing that Noah does upon exiting the ark is, quote, build an altar unto the Lord, end quote. We've been hovering over that actually for a number of weeks and all the crucial life lessons we've already gleaned from this, including making sure that our priorities are straight. Remember when you, when you are a young person, and we have young people here and we're glad for that, maybe they often hear this of their folks too. I remember being challenged by my folks, make sure that your priorities are straight. 
the challenge ultimately comes from God and the word of God. And Noah, again, by way of example, we are prompted to evaluate the priorities of our lives to make sure that they are straight, that God is number one in our lives. We, based upon the authority of God's word, said that life will not be right apart from God being number one in our lives. I'm able to recognize with you, especially with the, uh, a view to this July 4th weekend, that what is true of individuals is also true of nations. And you're familiar with Psalm 33 and 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I need not remind you that one of the major reasons why we as a nation have been so very much blessed of God in the past is because we have historically honored God and historically honored God's word. I wonder what a nation looks like who moves, which moves from God's favor to disfavor. Things are changing. They have been for a long, long time. These are interesting days. What does a nation look like? that has moved into God's disfavor. Our verse, all, and that's something for you to contemplate, but stick with me, please. Our verse has also begun to stir our hearts in regard to the all-important topic of worship. It's interesting, in our text, we don't actually have the word worship, and yet you can't read our text, and you can't watch Noah and his activities here without being prompted to think of the fact that the very first thing that Noah does upon exiting the ark is worship God. And he worships God with priority and passion, probably unlike the way that we do. And I will note with you that there's a principle in regard to true biblical worship which we have clearly noted in the past, and which is dramatically illustrated here by Noah, namely this, that true biblical worship, you're going you're gonna, to um, enjoy contemplating this. True biblical worship always involves sacrificial giving. It's worth repeating, true biblical worship always involves, on our part, sacrificial giving. In fact, I can restate that and probably do so in an even a more challenging way to y'all. We have, we're so quick to say and sing that we have worshipped. We have not actually worshipped if in the course of said Worship, we have not sacrificially given something to God. Now, before you leave, and, and I, I, I wasn't able to uh, prevent the hairs on the back of your neck stand, standing up, but hopefully I can keep you from leaving. Before you leave, let me quickly interject that the principle pertains to a lot more than just your money. And by the way, God's going to be reminding us of all kinds of things, and this isn't a message dealing with our money. You will quickly see with me that it's much broader than that. But, but listen, there ought not to be any arena in our life where God isn't number one, including, and I guess especially in regard to our physical resources. And by the way, if you've been around, and certainly if you know God, and if you have worked your way through the word of God at all, then you know that God at every turn is impressing God's people with the fact that we really don't own anything. It's not our money. He's entrusting all kinds of things to us, and with a view to that, then we realize that the challenge that God gives us relates to stewardship. How we use what he has granted and graced us with. God, and we sang this in one of our courses, which is interesting, God doesn't really need your money. 
And in regard to our money, it's not the only thing that we can and should be sacrificially giving. It goes way beyond our physical resources. It relates to, and we've used the terminology, it relates to our talents and it relates to our time. It involves our hearts, our love, our devotion, our allegiance, our obedience, our praise. We have a praise course time and we just assume that we have, uh, a, 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 we, we just automatically assume that we've worshipped God. But I'm back to the principle that if we haven't sacrificially given something to God that we have not worshipped. Like we sing, Lord, you are more Precious than silver, Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares to you. But do you realize that it's very possible for past Tom to stand up and sing that and for me to be completely unconscious of the words, the meaning of what I've just sang, and in regard to that, have I worshipped? It's very possible for Pastor Tom or for you all to stand up or even privately before God to sing those words and for our hearts to be marked by pride. If so, have we worshipped? And you say, well, Pastor Tom, you sing that song and you sing it from the heart, but what have you given to God if the principle holds that every time that we worship, we have sacrificially given something to God, then does it hold up to our praise and worship courses? And indeed it does. If I sing that from the heart, then all of a sudden I've ascribed to God his rightful place in my heart. All of a sudden, I have distanced him from the other small g gods that may have had a stronghold in my life. All of a sudden, I've forsaken the grave sin of idolatry. All of a sudden, God knows, because he reads my heart, that he indeed is number one, that there's nothing that rivals him. I've given him myself. I've given God my heart. I've given him my life. See, that's why, and we often state it, man, with a single chorus, one single blessed hymn, spiritual revival. Because it absolutely calls out from us something. We have not worshipped. If in said worship, we have not sacrificially given to God, something. And of course, God, what he's ultimately off after, and I, I, I'm challenged by this, he, he doesn't want my stuff, doesn't need it. He wants me. So we haven't worshipped if we haven't in said worship given something to God. And oh, what a, an example of sacrificial giving we have in our text. Look again at verse 20. I need to reread it with you. Genesis 8 and verse 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. For those of you that haven't been with us, I remind you in regard to burnt offerings, God gets everything. The entire sacrifice is burnt on the altar. And it always has been and will continue to be this way in regard to earthly soldier and that the Old Testament, we are not in that economy and we noted together, we're so glad with a view to Christ, once for all sacrifice for sins. We love Hebrews 10, 12 that says, This man, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered a sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. That's why we're saved today. That's why we can sing, saved, saved, saved. 
saved. That's why we know that we're on a journey, that the journey begins here on this earth but ends in glory. Why we know that heaven is our eternal home. And of course, as our earthly soldier unfolds, all oh, the amazing and graceful and merciful provisions by the Lord so that we are without excuse to live the very lives that he has commanded us to live. I, I, I got to read verse 20 again, sorry. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the Lord. The burnt offerings reminding us that really sets forth the idea that we would just be giving ourselves to God. Again, it all makes a whole lot of sense. But oh, what, a, what an amazing example of sacrificial giving on the part of Noah. Listen, first of all, he offers, he, he takes, you've got to think even of numbers. It's interesting, and I know we need to be a little bit careful about numbers because we haven't been given everything. But you ought to be thinking even about the numbers in regard to Noah's sacrifice here. He takes of every clean beast, all of the clean animals, and he takes of every clean fowl, all the clean birds, and he offers them as a burnt offering on the altar. Gone to God. First of all, we would have offered the unclean. But not, no, we would not have given God our best. Nor would we have given to God first. That's why God's people ought to pause here. It'd be easy to read right through the narrative and to, figure that, oh, these things really have nothing to do with this, especially as we reflect back on, you know, this being a part of the Old Testament economy and especially this idea of animal sacrifice and all which we have thoroughly discoursed together of late. But the principles here are absolutely applicable to us and are spot on. Noah gives the clean, the best, we would give the unclean. Noah gives to God first. We are in a pattern of giving to God last. We, we think somehow that it's pleasing to God that he gets the leftovers. And the thing that's especially grave about that is most of the time there's no leftovers. We say, mine, 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 mine. It's all gone. Oh, God, sorry. There's no leftovers. And here's Noah. Giving to God first. And giving to God the best. I'm, I'm wondering if you would speculate with me for just a, a couple of minutes in regard to all these things. I, this is interesting to me. I'm, it, it's a Tommy Till thought, so you've got to take it for what it's worth, but maybe it'll trigger some thinking on your part. It hit me that Noah didn't know. We, we think that all of these things are mechanically in place. It hit me that Noah didn't know for sure which animals or how many would stick around. The reason why I say that to you is because, remember, there has been and will continue to be a divine commission, both to man and animal, to multiply and fill or spread out over all the earth. I also thought in regard to Noah, trying to think of him thinking like a dad, because I am privileged to be one. I, I, I am certain, I will tell you, I know that you can relate to this. The hardest things for me in life are not those things that happen to me. They are those things that happen to my family. And I tried to get in Noah's mind, and I'm figuring, I, I, I'm certain of this, and I'm not saying this to you as a critique of him. I believe that this is 
divine as well, but I'm thinking that Noah's probably thinking, hey, I'm already responsible for four families. For me and my wife and then my three sons and my three sons and their wives, I'm already responsible for four families. And yet the very first thing that Noah does when he exits the ark is he builds an altar unto the Lord and sacrifices to the Lord in the form of a burnt offering of every clean beast and of every clean fowl. I don't know, and I, if, you don't, if you haven't seen this, it's certainly my fault and not yours, but listen, Noah is about to sacrifice the very thing that's going to play a crucial role in his survival, and not only in his survival, but the survival of his immediate family. We have already identified, and it will continue to be clear, that the clean animals have and will continue to prove to be the most domesticable. And I did not make that word up. And I pronounced it properly. It just was very slow. He's putting to death, he's offering to God the very things that will absolutely play a crucial role in his survival. Remember that Noah and his family, as they exit the ark, are doing so into a hostile and barren environment. It is post-flood. And the animals that he's sacrificing on the altar will play a key role in Noah's survival. Not only affording them clothes and not only affording them drink, but especially now affording them food. Where am I going to get food for my family? The clean animals are those that will prove to be the domesticated animals. Noah is putting to death, sacrificing not only the very animals that were going to play a key role in his survival, but he was putting to death the animals that he would have been the most familiar with. Something else you may not have thought of. What kind of relationship did Noah have with the animals on the ark for an entire year? And one of those animals that were already in the process of proving that they were going to be what you and I would call farm animals. What kind of relationship would Noah have with them? Mrs. Ann and I especially appreciate this. He was putting to death Buddy and Pollyanna. the best and the most precious to him. Given with gladness in his heart to the great God who is gracious and merciful and deserving of all, not just some, but all, I mentioned to you that we need to be a little bit careful about the numbers because we just aren't given. It's very interesting, the narrative here, and even if you have a good handle of the original language, when you take a look at the Hebrew again, you, you say, wow, um, God has done an, you know, a perfect job in communicating to us, true, to us his truth, but you read through the narrative and you say, wow, I... I, I wish that God would have said a little bit more, and that certainly comes into play with the numbers, and so I need to be careful about this, and I actually have a personal opinion based upon my own personal study that goes much deeper than what I'm about to share with you. But in effect, Noah gives to God at least one-seventh of all the flocks. And so when you do the math in regard to that, he's giving about 14% of what he had. By the way, I wanted to give you quickly... 
uh, an analogy to help you to un understand this. Let's say that you and I are standing um, at the very brink of, uh, 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 of uh, a desert. And we have all kinds of water bottles. And we know that each one is going to play a crucial role in us being able to travel across the desert. And then all of a sudden, out of deep appreciation in your heart for God, you take a number of the bottles of water and you pour them out in sacrifice to him. In effect, Noah gives to God one-seventh of all of his flocks, the flocks that will play a key role in his survival. And so if that is the case, then he actually gives more than a tithe, which sadly has become a dirty word for God's people. And speaking of the tithe, that's always been a good guide, by the way. And if you're thinking that this message is about the tithe, then you haven't heard a thing that has been set up until this point in time. And you certainly haven't been here at Calvary where, where we hardly ever talk about those things. But we talk about them when we come to them. And here's Noah giving probably about 14% of his flock, again, the very animals that will play a key role in his survival. And so it prompted me to think a little bit about the tithe. And, and so I'm reminding you of things that we've learned in the past, and that is that the tithe has always been and always will be in regard to this earthly soldier, and a good starting point for God's people in regard to their giving. And I, I need to be quick with this, but two very quick examples to you. The first relates to the great Old Testament patriarch Abraham, and so it's historical and biblical, and the other is contemporary. I remind you of something in regard to Abraham. He, by the way, is functioning before the law because one of the things that we say when God talks to us about the tithe is we say all that's inseparably linked to the law. But the problem is God's people were exercising this principle in regard to their giving long before the law was even established. It has always been a good starting point for God's people in regard to their giving, certainly with a view to our money, but also in regard to all the other things that we have the privilege of offering back to God. I, I need to quickly express this to you, and so I may not do a good job, but um, this event is recorded both in Genesis chapter 14, and then interestingly so, the Apostle Paul picks it up and recounts it in Hebrews chapter 7. And in these two places, we are informed that Abraham, before the establishment of the tithe in regard to Mosaic law, gave a tithe to God via Melchizedek. And both texts tells us that he gave a tenth of the spoils. Now let me catch you up to speed historically. Abraham had defeated a confederation of kings Remember, they had actually captured Sodom where Lot was living, and they not only took all the spoils of the city, but they actually took Lot. And once Abraham found out about that, he gathered together his lean, mean fighting machine. Some 318 men, again, the numbers are interesting to me. And Abraham uh, soundly defeats this confederation of kings. And Abraham subsequently is offered the spoils of the, Lord, uh, of the war, which he refuses. You with me so far? You with me so far? The king of Sodom and the other kings that in a sense he had rescued, they offer to Abraham the spoils of the war, and Abraham says no. And then the text in both places tells us that Abraham gives a tenth of the spoils which he has just refused to God via Melchizedek. Which means, not only in, in Tommy T language, that the tithe is coming directly out of Abraham's pocket. And by the way, I wish we had more time to discuss this because I am certain, based upon the flow of the narrative, that Abraham was just looking for an opportunity to, to give to God in this official way. 
But it's interesting, Abraham does something that you and I would never, ever dream of. And this is before the law, before the Mosaic law that would commission God's people to give a tenth of all that God has given to them. He takes a look at all the spoils of the, law, uh, uh, of the war, and as he refuses those spoils, he says, I must give to God a tenth of all of the spoils that I'm refusing. Did you hear that? Wow. And let me quickly say something to you about the word spoils. I'm looking at the Hebrew text and the Greek language and the Greek word acrothenion, and it means literally off from the top. If you've been to Calvary, you may ha remember that probably five or six or 10 or 11 years ago we talked about this. The word means literally off the top. Abraham, I remember grabbing a bunch of hymns and holding them and saying, this is, Abraham took off from the top to give to God. He didn't give from the bottom. He didn't do what we do. Mine, 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 mine. God, you get the leftovers. Oh, rats, it happened again. No leftovers. Abraham gives literally off from the top of the heap. He gives the best of the booty. Abraham was giving to God his best and was giving to God first off from the top. I wonder how God's people ought to give. And then a contemporary example. 57 second clip of Derek Carr NFL quarterback for the Oakland Raiders answering the question, what are you going to do with all of your millions of dollars? I'm asking you if you've ever heard anything like this before. Your priorities are in life and everything are well known, hmm. but it is a huge contract. Um, just, and you're not really an extravagant guy, but is there one thing that, you, that you're going to sort of splurge on that you could let Chick us know? Chick-fil-A, probably Chick-fil-A. Uh, <laughs> I've been eating clean, Lad. We got Lad here. He's been having me eat clean. I'll probably get some Chick Fil A. But uh, no, uh, first thing I'll do is I'll pay my tithe, like I have since I was in college, getting seven hundred dollars on a scholarship check. Um, you know that that won't change. I'll do that. Uh, I'll probably give my wife something nice. Uh, you know, even though she begs me not to, she she still gets coupons. Ever since we, ever since I've known her, she finds coupons. She gets online trying to find discounts and all those things and. Uh, none, none of that's going to change. The, the exciting thing for me, money-wise, honestly, is that this money's going to help a lot of people. Um, uh, you know, I'm very thankful to have it, that it's in our hands, because it's going to help people not only in this country, but in a lot of countries around the world. Um, and that's, what, that's what's exciting to me. Now, I know that he's not Abraham, and I fully realize, listen, I'm not naive, and I, two weeks in a row, have talked about Derek Carr, and I promise not to speak to, uh, of him again publicly for at least three or four more weeks. <laughs> I realize he's not Abraham, and I realize that tomorrow I could wake up uh, early tomorrow morning and listen to Sports Center and be informed that the man that I was beginning to hold in high regard has committed some kind of grave sin. Gone, 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 gone is his testimony, I fully realize. But have you ever heard anything like that from a celebrity? where the very first word out of his mouth in regard to giving is his tithe to God. And he communicates to us, by the way, you and I, we recognized last week that he's the last one that we're going to feel sorry for. And I also realize with both of you to Mr. Carr and to Mr. Abraham that we could take a look at those guys and we say, hey, I understand why they were given off from the top of the heap. I understand why they gave to God first. I understand why they gave to God best, because after they gave, they still had a whole mess of stuff. But the principle holds. And I would venture to say that there's someone, maybe even here today, maybe one of our precious um, widows, that honestly before God realized that Things are tough, and maybe from month to month they're wondering how they're going to meet their monthly bills, and yet they're the first ones to give, and they're the first ones to testify that you never can outgive God, and you'll never regret giving to God His due. 
the question that we're left with this morning in light of all of these things and this commission on the part of God for God's people to give, again, not just our finances, but ourselves, our hearts, our love, our devotion, our allegiance, the question becomes, why would we sacrificially give? And the answer is, because he has sacrificially given. All we need to do in our mind's eye is go to Calvary. And all of a sudden we're reminded that we can never outgive God. And all of a sudden we're reminded that God in his grace and mercy, he's the seeking and saving God, did what needed to be done for us to be rescued from the condemnation and penalty of our sin. We were on the road to eternal loss and ruin. And then came Jesus. Think about all that God has given to you. This is the appropriate time. This weekend is the appropriate weekend. This day is the appropriate day. Just think about all that God has given to you. Think about God's Son. Think about your new life in Christ. Think, you, think about the forgiveness of sin that you have in Christ and Christ alone. Think about being permanently made a part of the family of God, sons and daughters of God. Think about the power and the peace and the provision that Christ day by day and moment by moment affords you as you finish out this earthly sojourn. Think about heaven as your eternal home. And can you believe it? Think about the great eternal reward for those who have in this earthly sojourn sacrificially given back to God. It all belongs to God. He entrusts it to our care. And when we sacrificially give it back, he rewards us. What a system. Let's pray. A quick word. God, child of God, you... I think you have your commission. I don't even know how to reiterate it. Leave it with the Holy Spirit of God. Quick word for those who may be here today or within the sound of this voice who have not yet put their personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior. You've heard the gospel a number of times again this morning. We so often, and this has been throughout the course of our study in Genesis, I love saying it, we worship and serve the seeking and saving God. We turned our backs on him. God sought us out. And he did what he needed to do by sending his son. Christ loved us so much that he took our place on Calvary's cross. He actually bore the penalty of our sin and then God struck him for it. He suffered through our health so that we wouldn't have to. And so it's Christ and Christ alone through his death, burial, and resurrection that offers to every man, woman, and young person the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I plead with you to come. Say, Pastor Tom, how do you do that? Well, you you can actually physically come. I'd be thrilled to sit down with you and help you, but, but listen, you can come in the quiet recesses of your heart, and you can pray even now in this quiet moment to receive Christ as your own personal Savior from sin. I'd plead with you to do that. And if you do that, that you would let someone know, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We've been able to be together spending this time in your word. Thank you for Noah, for the example that he affords us. Thank you for all of these life lessons about having our priorities straight. Thank you for revisiting with us the all-important topic of worship. And thank you for the clarion and high call of God on our lives to be sacrificially giving back to you of all that you have sacrificially given to us. May we leave here this morning true biblical worshipers, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn your hymnal to number 486, number 486.
Open my eyes that I may see. Let's stand together. Sing the first verse, 486. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth you have for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unlock and set me free. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the country that we live in, founded on your principles. We pray that you will forgive us for turning our backs on you. We pray for revival. But we thank you that we are still free to worship you. I pray that we will take the message we heard today and live sacrificially for you throughout the week to come. Please guide us home safely and bring us back safely tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.